The panel was called Perpetual Peace, the Rule of Law and Civil Education. So we tried to talk on different aspects uh, um, of, uh, of this uh, uh, topic, uh, taking into account the crises uh, which are being encountered by Russia as well as uh, other countries. Um, and so we selected, uh, we opted to talk about uh, the growing uh, nationalism and uh, the context uh, of this uh, trend and also uh, the um, circumstances whereby many internal um, conditions or internal uh, status uh, curbs uh, the international uh, events. The catastrophe, uh, the disaster of Aleppo as I uh, as I uh, gave uh, the example, um, is uh, certainly under-reflected in uh, the mind of the Russian society. And the Russian society, including the, the opposition, um, including the two forums which took place in Berlin and Vilnius uh, lately, did not uh, pay much attention to this um, humanitarian disaster and Russia's responsibility in this context. Uh, the um, presentations, uh, the contributions um, of the presenters uh, uh, also dealt with the Russian-European relations and Stefan Mele spoke about it. Uh, um, uh, it was uh, emphasized that the dialogue must continue against all odds and uh, uh, the uh, problems of intergovernmental relations should in no way become an obstacle for the development of relations between the societies. And uh, in spite of all uh, the difficulties uh, which we're seeing in, uh, in the Russia-EU relations, uh, however, the global citizenship uh, interaction must deepen, must continue. The more people from Russia travel, uh, uh, the more R Russians uh, can come to Europe, uh, the better. Uh, Pilar Bonnet, our next presenter, um, spoke uh, about uh, the Russian media and how they um, how they uh, manipulate uh, the uh, public uh, um, uh, mind, uh, and uh, she gave the illustrations uh, uh, of how uh, a journalist uh, may become uh, uh, may become uh, a record keeper for the decision makers or for the politicians, thus uh, formulating the agenda as dictated by the uh, political class. Uh, in such uh, uh, deplorable circumstances, the journalist becomes uh, a mere trumpet uh, for the uh, regime. Uh, Irhaus, um, uh, our CEO has uh, our next uh, uh, presenter spoke about uh, the contents uh, of a of a um, billiard uh, um, in the game of billiard uh, and how the balls um, collide uh, uh, and how the overcoming of stereotypes uh, as well as uh, uh, um, the ranging uh, of these priorities may become an uh, interference uh, interfering factor without allowing us uh, to achieve uh, the requisite level of uh, dialogue and by your leave uh, I personally um, in my uh, intervention uh, reflected on the personal responsibility during the war by uh, deriving uh, from uh, the uh, essay of Hannah Arendt on the personal responsibility under dictatorship That's speaking about uh, uh, the contribution uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, that every one of us can make, and in this uh, uh, context, uh, the um, I think that Catherine Lalumiere, uh, in her presentation, uh, asked a, a very fair question: if uh, we should uh, rather not be uh, talking about why we do something and not how we do something. So, uh, if we um, uh, apply or reapply this question about to the purpose, then we, we do have a certain objective setting. 
and uh, so uh, this is uh, not about uh, repeating the mantras of democracy or, or uh, indeed confining ourselves uh, to the lofty words. Uh, um, it seems that uh, over the past 25 to 30 years we have seen great uh, respect um, in uh, uh, great progress in 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 um, in the uh, in the official. Uh, respect uh, for these uh, concepts. Um, Han Arend uh, spoke uh, about um, this uh, uh, in her essays uh, um, that uh, it is uh, more important uh, to uh, question uh, why we do something um, because. Uh, Uh, there may be a conservative majority which may indeed be changing the paradigm of its uh, convictions with the same fervor, even though uh, the uh, principles uh, may well change. So the personal responsibility in this context uh, uh, gains uh, the primary momentum. And in this sense, uh, we're seeing uh, 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 the, the, so it is uh, not only uh, not not just the the commandment as uh, thou uh, shall not kill, but also that you may not and will not and must not live uh, uh, your life uh, with that murder within yourself. So uh, the uh, Christian principle of uh, of mutual recognition um, presupposes that the world uh, has been and is uh, populated by very different peoples, but it is only the the uh, spirit of enlightenment and indeed uh, uh, spirit uh, of uh, uh, of um, uh, travel and commerce uh, that can help us uh, to overcome the stereotypes and uh, and uh, uh, considered. Uh, I consider others uh, as um, as foes. It is difficult for me to um, recapitulate uh, in greater detail because at the end of our section we even went as far as the epistemological debates about dis de uh, decision making. But such was the verb of our discussion. Thank you. Can you hear me? All right. Thank you for being right on time. And uh, this is uh, very nice uh, as, uh, as, uh, as we will pass on to the next group. And now we pass the floor to Nikolai Petrov. He will tell us about the result of the second panel, which is uh, called War and Peace. Every Russian knows what it means. Our organizers formulated our problem in a modest way. And I think we managed somehow to resolve the problem and cover the issue. We started from classic reminiscences and took uh, three notes left Tolstoy, Orwell, 1984, and Bob Dylan, new Nobel Award winner with his anti-war songs. I will try to use it now, uh, although I don't think I will uh, cover everything which was marvelously presented by Chris Cocker and Fyodor Lukyanov. I understand that they both are absent because they are on a great demand. And I will also present what Andrei Kolesnikov was saying. He fortunately is here. And if I misrepresent something, he would correct me. We started uh, from saying that we didn't reach the bad universalism. It's with us. And that's where you have to remember Orwell's novel, where he describes Oceania. It's not Eurasia, it's Anglo-American countries uh, with the Ministry of Truth, Big Brother. 
and all sort of this stuff. Such elements, unfortunately, are uh, present at different sides of the demarcation line. As to good universalism, it is diminishing, and uh, partly deglobalization is to blame because countries go to their national rooms or apartments and the role of the society and civil society is great. We should not allow to our countries, our states, to take everything that formerly was delegated at sub-national level. We ourselves should be a dense fabric uh, not allowing them to monopolize everything they call national sovereignty. Chris Cocker was quite precise in showing all the reasons, factors of uh, war, and someone interpreted uh, in the way that the war is inevitable, uh, but he was against it. Fyodor Lukyanov described the picture of the modern world and the role of Russia in it as not necessarily a chief opponent and the guilty party of everything that is going on because mostly another side is responsible for what has happened uh, in our world. Another side which has built this order within the last 25 years, Andrei Kolesnikov asked whether the Russians wanted a war uh, in more ways uh, than one they do, but mostly they want to have it sitting on their sofa and looking at the screen, but nobody wants real blood and real victims. And uh, in this regard, we have to explain uh, to people that war is not something uh, interesting with shooting. Uh, Cocker was saying that people presently do not read War and Peace or Orwell. They play games, computer games, mostly about war, which is quite beautiful, bloodless, and generous. As to our recommendations, I have already mentioned uh, one, meaning dense fabric of the society. Uh, another one is intellectual elites. Luckily, our audience uh, was mostly a post-Soviet with the domination uh, of the uh, Russian presence. So it was probably more clear. Maybe it's fairer in relation to other countries, too. Unfortunately, in our country, we have less intellectual elite whose influence is not related to their position. It's not the Minister of Culture uh, or not the most important intellectual following the Kremlin version, but influential people in their gist. So uh, this intellectual elite is not being reproduced. And that's why our meetings are capable of producing intellectual level or intellectual elite. Such meetings are extremely important and they should be continued and supported. Now, item three is venues. Unfortunately, reproduction of intellectual elites is not there because presently we have no venues which existed in the past physically where they could discuss like we today and yesterday the problems of our concern. There are not even virtual uh, venues or sites which were there uh, in the Soviet time when, for instance, Novi Mir magazine published uh, some novel and it was discussed by uh, all the country. So we have to retain uh, venues which still do exist, including this one, and we have to look for new venues to support certain intellectual level of our discussions. 
And the last issue is not a, uh, a, it, it's a theory of specific deeds. Quite recently, we were in Kiev, and our Ukrainian partners said that they would not be discussing anything else, because uh, for them, um, only war is on the agenda. Well, you have to understand it. So uh, the war at the east of the Ukraine is not something abstract. It's pretty specific. So if we can somehow participate in the discussion of this problem, solution of this problem, forming public opinion in this regard should do it. A new venue is the European dialogue. And in the framework of this venue, we are going to deal with this Russian-Ukrainian or European interaction on the issues of uh, relationships between Russia and Ukraine, and specifically war in Donbas. And that was the last specific recommendation of our group. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nikolai. All sessions seem to be uh, uh, interrelated, because at the first session you also discussed war and peace. At the second session, uh, well, you mentioned the big brother, and the big brother is a good passage to the third session. Uh, so it's safety versus freedom, or freedom versus safety. Okay, security versus freedom, that's how it was named in English version. Andrei Soldatov. Our session was pretty interesting to my mind, and I was surprised by the fact that we talked a lot about fears. Fears, we were saying, helped countries or states to explain uh, to the population of many countries that crimes against the state are to be punished uh, more rigorously than crimes against humans. And this is the norm that is nowadays considered normal by many people. And such things were sold in many countries during wars or after wars and they are still codified in many criminal codes of different countries. To secure this state uh, safety or to ensure this state security, private uh, freedoms and public freedoms suffered in this new epoch of digital revolution, we turned out to be in a unique situation because Internet mixed public and private freedoms. And it's hard to understand whether the state introduced something repressive uh, in relation to Internet or introduces new uh, ways of surveillance and what is going to suffer in the first place, uh, communications between people uh, when they want just to talk to each other freely or Internet suffers as a place for public discussions or someone attacks internet as a source of access to non-sanctioned information. Ben Wagner uh, was saying that rules are always changing. Uh, there are private actors which also deal with security, and it's hard to understand where is the borderline uh, between public and private companies to ensure security and the system is supposed to be more and more efficient, but it doesn't work. People still think uh, that they are not sure in their future. They have no sense of security and they need uh, more. They require more measures for uh, safety. And there is no end to this story. Irina Baragan was saying that uh, trying to secure everybody 
we face the situation when people who are not threatening anything, uh, but they do not behave uh, uh, well regularly, and they are not united in some groups, uh, they find themselves in some black lists. Uh, people who are interested in some kind of music, soccer fans, people who represent different confessions which are not uh, officially favored, and that is enough to place them into lists of potential troublemakers, people who may bring about problems. This process has been started long ago in Russia, since 2008, after the economic crisis, when uh, the authorities were afraid that this crisis uh, would uh, bring in turbulent times. So the goals are quite dubious, and, and the price uh, to watch these people is enormous. It's uncompared with declared goals. So to combat people who might be potentially problematic, uh, you spend enormous resources, which in the past were spent to uh, hit the organized crime. There was a symptomatic episode in our recent history uh, when the structure responsible for combating organized crime said and that uh, this organized crime has been defeated in Russia and now we have to deal with extremists. Lev Gershenzon was saying that the problem is not only in the attacking side, and we mean here public and private companies, like, for instance, companies that aggressively collect personal data on us. But we, as audience, should also reconsider our behavior and understand that we should be more critical to sources of our information. We live in the world of information, surrounded by all sorts of news. Some of them are pretty emotional, and it's difficult for us to understand or to consider, to perceive in this news unemotionally, but we have to be more conscious about what we are told by way of information. There may be technological or ethical um, approaches here, but this issue is quite open. John Lloyd was uh, saying, and it seems to me uh, very important, that the situation is quite paradoxical. On the one hand, we deal with secret services in the Western world and in Russia are not entirely efficient in combating the obvious threats, like uh, combating acts of terror. But, and even for me, it was a surprising fact, and this fact is that popularity of special services has been growing in Europe and maybe even in Russia. But the trust to special services uh, grows up among regular people. So the point was made that uh, on the one hand, uh, or rather, uh, the matter is that uh, it's good uh, to uh, announce uh, uh, greater accountability of secret services. It's great. But uh, we all realize that at some point uh, those secret services uh, may tell us that we are the secret services and uh, we cannot report uh, to our parliaments in real time and brief them on all the operations uh, we are conducting. Uh, at some point, you really you should trust us and uh, believe that we do right things. And uh, it's uh, obvious that uh, this trust was undermined uh, on the part of uh, U.S. Uh, secret services following the invasion of Iraq and uh, in Russia uh, in, uh, following 1999 and other events, uh, the situation became the same. So in most of our countries, uh, there is not uh, large uh, trust in uh, secret services, but uh, uh, that trust can be restored through uh, the establishment of uh, public institutions so that uh, secret services are more accountable to the people. And uh, you can also attempt to uh, promote investigative journalism. 
and strengthening those public institutions uh, which uh, uh, Mr. Schlossberg uh, talked about. Or you can do simple things. You can scare people and uh, arrive at the same share of trust on the part of the people. And fortunately, we came to a quite a pessimistic conclusion uh, that uh, the uh, latter uh, choice uh, could be more attractive for secret services because fear works very efficiently, not just to uh, gain new authority and uh, automatic approval uh, um, uh, by the people of uh, some repressive laws, but also it could work uh, even if you want to restore trust to those repressive bodies. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank uh, the audience was uh, carried away uh, by your <laughs> remarks and not not uh, okay. So uh, 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 thank you. And uh, uh, panel four uh, was not related uh, directly to the three previous, but in fact it was. And uh, uh, the title was the Hist historic memory and uh, politics. Uh, memory and. Uh, uh, historical politics, and I think uh, Irina Sharbakova is in a position to tell us uh, um, about the deliberations uh, at the panel. Uh, thank you. I think uh, uh, while listening to the previous speakers, I uh, realized that uh, we overlapped uh, in many deliberations uh, and uh, 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 many people uh, from my audience uh, felt uh, pity that we could not uh, be present uh, uh, simultaneously uh, at all to the three, th four sections. And, uh, and uh, also, uh, uh, the point was made yesterday uh, when we were talking about uh, values, universalism, and the problems of globalism. And uh, mm, uh, we realized that both us, uh, our opponents, and rivals uh, uh, they uh, keep on uh, talking about same things uh, from different perspectives. And I would say that they are quite skillful uh, in uh, uh, talking about those things. Uh, at uh, my panel, uh, we shared uh, some of the roles, and uh, uh, therefore there was uh, uh, very interesting remarks by Jutta Scher. She was talking about a case, and. Uh, uh, speaking of uh, human memory, uh, it's quite important to uh, think of specific things and cases, because if you have some, um, uh, many things become obvious uh, to us, and uh, I feel pity that not uh, everybody heard that, because she uh, gave us a very thorough um, uh, assessment uh, of uh, building an image of the Russian universe and how that Russian universe penetrates to the uh, European environment. And, and uh, uh, she uh, was explaining, uh, and uh, if uh, it's not the uh, so-called Russian universe, but if it is uh, the universe of uh, uh, immigration and the people who left uh, the Soviet Union or post-Soviet Union, uh, so uh, uh, it is an attempt to uh, uh, win uh, their uh, uh, sentiments too, and uh, uh, it's just an instruction on uh, the way you should view the Russian universe and Russian orthodoxy, and uh, um, it uh, was uh, really a sketch uh, of uh, uh, Russian authorities' attempts to design that world. And uh, Ruta uh, uh, gave us a very uh, good account of how uh, that world is being captured how uh, new churches are being built and uh, uh, the purposes of all that. Um, and uh, it's interesting to note that uh, those million uh, people efforts uh, are denied uh, uh, by the current political situation because plans were great and a great effect was expected, for instance, from the inauguration of the um, Russian uh, Cultural Center in Paris. But uh, uh, that uh, propaganda campaign failed. Uh, it uh, uh, has uh, a very direct relevance uh, with uh, memory and uh, history events uh, manipulation. The other uh, presentation uh, brought us back uh, to 
uh, a very important area. Uh, we keep on talking about memory and historical memory, and many of you present here may recall uh, such things as Agamben, Nora, and all other theoreticians who wrote um, their uh, papers on that subject. And uh, still, it's a, a very uh, broad area, it's a very broad topic, quite vague, and that's why um, it gives a lot of uh, uh, grounds uh, for quasi historical myths. And uh, it, it, it was important uh, to see that Diana Pinto uh, brought us back to all those discussions and uh, she articulated a number of, uh, uh, based on Astman's uh, uh, theories and uh, cultural history history, uh, memories, uh, their definitions. And she articulated uh, the idea of various memories, uh, various forms of memory, uh, which uh, um, are in existence. And uh, I found it very important. I can think of uh, some of them. It's uh, first uh, split memory, uh, uh, which is quite uh, uh, intensively used uh, since uh, that split memory, and uh, I think Diana gave us right uh, illustrations. Uh, she spoke of how it works in post-Soviet uh, environment, uh, and in one family, in the same family, uh, uh, victims and heroes were different, and, uh, and even a single individu indi individual uh, could be both blade, blamed and pra praised. And uh, so uh, that was about the split memory, and uh, it's important uh, to mention that uh, that uh, split memory uh, may produce a neutralizing effect. If it is really uh, truly split, it's kind of an explosion. But okay, I cannot go into further details. There is no, there was another notion of a parallel uh, m uh, memory. And uh, th th those uh, memories uh, may exist in the same uh, 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 chronotype and in the same uh, historical uh, time. Uh, and very often they exist in parallel or sometimes they are in conflict, uh, like uh, uh, Jewish and uh, Polish memories. And uh, Dana uh, articulated another notion of uh, the uh, uh, construed or organized memory. And uh, it has to do with uh, the a historical policy that uh, authorities, uh, power, uh, is designs pursuing their, their goals. Um, uh, there was a lot of historians in the audience, uh, so um, uh, many people made their contributions, uh, which was uh, quite uh, productive. And I f uh, felt to be lucky um, uh, to see uh, many people from former Soviet republics in the audience. and. Uh, we saw that we uh, still uh, have a lot of connections and uh, I mean uh, those problems uh, that are common uh, to us both in terms of historical memory and uh, memories and uh, methodology uh, methodologies that are being used uh, uh, and uh, uh, because uh, uh, we cannot say that the monument to Ivan the ter terrible that uh, is erected in uh, Ariol, or the monument to uh, Grand Prince Vladimir uh, to be erected in Moscow two weeks later, that uh, they uh, really pertain to true historical um, uh, cases. It is uh, out of history, it's uh, uh, of uh, another world. And uh, uh, it was important for us to see what really happened and to, uh, at the point uh, when uh, uh, those uh, uh, memory wars were started, and uh, it happened that uh, in 1998, 90, uh, when the memorial uh, uh, NGO was uh, set up, then the, it, we, we saw that the memories of uh, the terror of great purges, and uh, Lena Nemirovska uh, gave an account of that, and uh, we saw how it happened in Germany, and uh, how it happened in uh, other 
uh, countries uh, who were defeated uh, in the war. So, and out of the pathos of uh, the denial of war, um, it led to the public consensus. And uh, it, uh, we, we believe that uh, um, it was uh, something that could unite us. And uh, we saw uh, some points about the uh, n attempts to design um, the, um, uh, ethnic memories and uh, something that led to uh, other um, conflicts. I would confine myself to uh, mentioning uh, only a few of questions that uh, uh, we uh, received from the floor. And uh, some of them were quite important, and uh, those questions were asked by our colleagues from Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Ukraine. And uh, 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 by and large, uh, they spoke about the same thing. Uh, rather, uh, I would uh, say that what uh, can really a weak and uh, depressed uh, civil society do about uh, that historical memory and uh, education? What uh, uh, school textbooks uh, should we have when uh, 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 the authorities uh, make uh, attempts to capture all those uh, tools? And. Um, there was a question from a, a colleague from Kyrgyzstan about the wholesale uh, uh, demand in uh, memories. If you want uh, this kind of memory, we can erect this monument and uh, uh, the um, other way around. Uh, so uh, we uh, mm, uh, saw how this postmodernist uh, um, eclectics uh, leverages uh, the uh, true memories. And uh, uh, there was a traditional question about uh, such phenomenon as uh, uh, redemption, uh, repension, uh, and uh, when uh, uh, Soviet times people meet uh, uh, and they can discuss um, um, that movie, that film, uh, and uh, it's hard to uh, come to a single conclusion because we all had a feeling that uh, we just uh, uh, touched upon and only raised some of the points and the dialogue is to be continued. And it was important that <coughs> uh, we kept on uh, talking um, uh, after the session and on the sidelines and the margins uh, of our work conference. And uh, it implies that uh, any kind of opportunities are to be uh, used and uh, so that uh, we could uh, 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 really promote uh, civic initiatives and uh, uh, freely discuss that critical part of the um, post-Soviet uh, environment, including, uh, say, a Ukrainian crisis. So it's important to ask those questions and discuss them. But uh, we can see that bilateral attempts uh, 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 all, all, uh, often fail. We see that it is across the post-Soviet space. Something is sure to grow out of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we have ten minutes to go to give the floor to the audience. It's little, of course, but it's better than nothing. So if you want to ask a question or maybe you have comments, please raise your hand and we will be happy to give you the floor. Well, if there are no volunteers, then probably I'm ready to volunteer on my own. That's really... Yes, we do have somebody who... Yes, please. Yes, please use the microphone. Thank you very much. what goes on in the macro world, so to say, and locally. For me to understand what's going on in my country, and all these questions actually have to do with the search for universalism. And today a question arose, what can we have in common? We were saying that we used to have common literature, speaking about last century, but somehow it leveled off, 
speaking about the visual space, about cinema, also very many uh, things have happened since. What have we got in place together? It's probably many gaps and and uh, the victory and the reds and the whites means the revolution. All those horrible bus march and the Georgian cross, which was given for killing them, and Georgian ribbon today. So I probably, as I was leaving this forum, I will probably try to think at length what can we have in common. And the saddest thing is that we are speaking about today's situation, about the real politic, about the future, but even in our past, this is what something Lev Schlossberg discussed, we are seeing fragmentation of values that is very large. It's hard, so hard to understand it. And the concept of the Russian world, it's not something that brings us together, it's rather fragments us even further, That's which makes the search for universalism even more difficult. And Mrs. Pinto, was saying important things about the imposed memories and about those whose opinion was not heard. And those who were not heard, uh, they get more and more numbers and it all gives rise to protests. And in uh, from the country where I get from, it all it gives rise to religious radical protest and it's very hard to even get it more difficult to find common ground. So talking and debating this is not available today. And one had to travel to Berlin to get this opportunity because irrevocably I haven't been to Moscow. It's a long time since I was in Moscow last, where I went so often to satisfy this intellectual hunger. But nowadays it's not available and it's really something very important to me. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I do not see anybody raising hands. Oh, yes, I do. Oh, yes, I do. Alexander, you now have the floor. Alexander Korovin from Starlepol, Association of Blue Jackets. And today we were discriminated against. We were not given the floor on the panel War and Peace that I attended and explained why. Indeed, there are many people from Russia there were few participants from post-Soviet countries because the degree of aggression, degree of propaganda hysterics uh, with us is so high that even educated people and people who perfectly realize the situation in the world, they begin to believe that the war is inevitable, that the war, war is inevitable. This is the case, especially in those who have children or have two sons. For me, it's something that I take very personally. I. I have a very good idea what that stands for. In case we see the repeat of the situation in pre-World War I, when everybody was reluctant to wage a war, but every further step of political elites would lead to the fact that nobody wanted to give way. And this gradually led to a global conflict. This session was interesting. What was interesting about it is that the experts gave maybe, I'll put it, maybe an optimistic view. Like they identified optimistic markers indicating that this situation is something that may lead to conflict, to major conflicts. It's, pro it's not feasible because no resources are available. There is no political will, but regrettably, we are not insured against this situation. But. What I liked about the point raised by Andrei Kolesnikov, that indeed this is a story mostly seen on TV. The example of a woman who like, uh, was presented weather forecast. So it's as to the weather in Syria and Aleppo that this weather was good and favorable for bombings. This indeed shows, is indicative of what is going on in our public space too. What is horrible about it is that the state has been making an effort, but these efforts are made by very talented journalists, very intelligent people, took the side of the party of the war, and in point of fact they have refined their, their, their talent in breeding this aggression and growing this aggression that one feels upset. But I would like to thank the experts because they sort of brought 
this fear down, maybe not for long, but once we get back it will return to us, but in the long run let us hope for the future, as they say, do what you must and let things that will happen, happen. Thank you, thank you. We, well, it's not always that too. Uh, this is a pun, because in Russia, gradus means also to drink wine, for example, or beer after vodka. So it's not always good, but this is the case when it is. I am Durov from St. Petersburg Center of Strategy. I attended two panels, and, um, and also after the meeting yesterday and after the sections, I would like maybe the panel chairs to comment. Did I make the right ch a conclusion that each of us should make an effort, make a try, uh, to make, to adopt into the state system of education, to adopt the values that we just discussed, that the teaching of literature, which shapes the personality of a person, of history, of social sciences, political science that I teach, that f and that we teach the programs as we come up with a new synopsis as well as new curriculum so that our educational activity, enlightenment activity, should be introduced into the resources of the state. Would you like that the panel chairs to comment on this? Well, are you willing to comment on this? A very simple answer, I suppose, that this is not mandatory and this is not the objective that we can pose before us right now. Speaking about our section panel, we had maybe uh, ambiguity of uh, translation, because civic education in Russia stands for гражданское просвещение, although education is both образование, it means education, like formation, and enlightenment as просвещение. But if you wish to hear my opinion, I didn't suppose that is required. I suppose the objective right now is not about the state and its politics, and its, sorry, its policy. It has to do with the society, with the institutions that are supposed to be grown on the base of civil society. So for me, state policy in uh, education is not is out of frame. It's not something we discuss. Probably we need other sites to do it. But the fact that the society should, and individuals who are in this, who are part of this society, and people who may uh, realize the uh, importance and responsibility and assume this, responsibility, it's a different level, and it better stay away from the state. You know, there's, there is this Fiddler in the Roof, where this musical starts. The question is, Rabbi, and he says, God save the king, God save the king. Again, it's, it's a pun, which means let the king or the Tsar stay away from us. It's as he can. So I suppose you can look it up on the, our civic education website. And a week before this forum, we had a talk with Vyacheslav Ilyvanovich Bachmin, dedicated to civic enlightenment and civic education, which discussed in great detail, amongst other things, the questions that you just raised. Well, probably we'll take another um, question, Artyom. Well, Atem Filatov from St. Petersburg, but I attended one panel only. But what I liked about is what I interested in terms of policy in memory and in security. A greater role is played by intermediate hybrid out of state institutions, because if you speak about his uh, memorial plaque to the Marshal Mannerheim, is either Russian general or a Finnish state of war and accessory to Nazis. It was set up by the unestablished persons in St. Petersburg, people close to the Russia's historic society. Then information, when they burn the cars, and it has special services who get it, and as a colleagues from a number of publications, it's a factor of trolls who are not really, not have to do anything with education. So. The question is, what do we resp how do we respond to that, and what do we do about this? Because we could really come up with some reasons to be unhappy with the state. And there are even, say, court institutions and others, say. But when you speak about this, this sort of hybrid, ambiguous um, entities, how does the civic society 
is respond to this? Uh, how should we respond? This is my... No. Well, Artyom, a question to you, uh, just for to supplement. I would like to give the floor to the former ambassador of Republic of Finland in to Russia, Mr. Newberg, as I listen to your deliberations on Monarchy. I just say the following thing: the whole history with that with that uh, memorial for uh, for for uh, Gustav Mannerheim, Mannerheim Paruski in 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 Saint Petersburg is a classical example of history policy that went wrong, and it went wrong really badly. That was something that had nothing to do with Finland. It was purely a Russian internal thing. Uh, but what, what I mind and what we mind is the good name of my country and the good name of Marsha Mannerheim, who stopped the Red Army twice, that is in 1939-40 and 1944, to be dragged into an internal Russian debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Probably, I suppose we need to respond because this is a question was directly uh, was a question to me. May I respond very fast? It's just first in in general uh, in the field of law. Indeed, and in the field of the laws that do not violate the constitution, and we do have laws that go against the constitution, as we see it. The memorial speaks quite distinctly about this, the so-called law about, uh, about condemnation of Nazism, let alone the law of foreign agents. If we discuss a normal situation, then this marginal or non-marginal, not necessarily marginal initiatives need to be treated very much as it is determined by the law. If they attack people, if they pour uh, uh, as it happened to our teachers and our students where they really poured um, uh, just um, solution of antiseptic on them, then it is a case for the law to interfere when, depending on whether they cross or not cross the line here. But the situation is, why don't we tell the truth to each other? But the situation is that we see such a situation evolving, and in Russia, indeed, Many things, especially when glassness means openness, is so strongly jeopardized that it's almost being taken care of. It is the voice of the civil society that is less and less heard because the stories on television on the TV about us and on Russian 24, and it's broadcast to millions of people, and they keep telling God knows what about memorial. We're trying to defend our name in court, but it doesn't work. And thus this conflict, regrettably, goes beyond the field of the civil society, the scope of civil society, and it's a very severe situation, and uh, the efforts that the Memorial has been applying all these years, incredible to maintain the historic memory and so on and so forth. It turns out that they were, how shall I put it, are being pushed away from this the main and field of public discussion. They are under severe threat and under severe pressure. So we can keep saying to each other that this is the matter for civil society, for civic enlightenment, whatever. If this becomes, thanks to the policy of the state, impossible, or almost impossible, then this is when we should give it a thought whether, whether indeed we can use every opportunity. But this, again, a very different story. I apologize for being uh, somewhat nervous about this remark. If I may add some optimism to this, especially that my presentation was highly pessimistic, then probably we should understand that all these un informal actors, there are certain reasons for that, and the reason is that the contract or the very idea about control of, of the so Russian society has changed. If, say, for 12 years, like the idea was very simple. The society preferred to be very passive and delegated its political freedoms to the Kremlin and let the professionals do their business. You know, like the state Duma is not the place for discussions, that is a quote. It was clear after protests that the protests had to undergo some change, and it did change. It did change for the mobilization model, but the problem is that this mobilization model cannot carry on 
as long as the previous models exist. And this can be seen, you can ask the Kolesnikov who discussed it at length, that in point of fact that the stage four, step four, society mobilization, this charge we received after the Crimea, and actually after Sochi, it's, it's getting to its end. But in order to show that this like works, we must involve other informal actors, such as Nord, uh, or um, All Russia Popular Front and uh, not sorry, and Cossacks and um, and we're reaching the uh, actually the climax maybe and maybe we should ask the sociologists, but it's surely not the beginning of the great ascent that the whole society would mobilize itself and start killing its enemies. At least I hope this is the case. And so far, the sociological studies seem to support me in this thinking. Thank you. In point of fact, our time is actually up. But it's very hard for me to resist the charm of the youth uh, chamber of uh, public chamber in Penza region. Natasha, I would like to give you the floor. Well, in point of fact, I can't but reflect this panel we had and what happened after that. But in point of fact, it's thanks to this site that Further on, we continued a very interesting conversation with Alexandra from Ukraine, and um, it seemed to me that we are on a territory where we share the same values, and we seem to be discussing similar things. But as we continue to discuss it, we realize that we never reached um, common ground. We started the conversation, who is responsible for the events that are taking place, why it happened, and we never agreed. And after the discussion... Having uh, strolled uh, for a while, I stopped uh, and understood that the question uh, that comes to my mind is the question of universalism. And indeed, we are all humans uh, who share the same uh, characteristics. And even though we are still uh, uh, using and maybe construing uh, the same facts and circumstances differently, it is uh, doubly important to have uh, certain uh, forums uh, or um, a public space uh, whereby uh, such uh, uh, questions can be discussed. But the pain uh, is uh, one and uh, the same for all. Even though a conflict uh, may exist, it is important uh, to find uh, the uh, actual ways uh, where we can discuss uh, this conflict. So my, my heartfelt thanks to the organizers. Well, I think that Natalia ended this uh, session with a very important phrase. Uh, thank you for, for your words. Uh, and as um, much as I understand, uh, we shall now pass on uh, uh, who will not be delivered by Ivan Krastev, because he's not here, but by the uh, chairman of the advisory board of the board of directors of our school, uh, Mr. John Lloyd.